Grindset. Inside the mind of successful entrepreneurs with your host, Cynthia Daniels and William Sprack. I think sometimes we over plan things and that can kind of cause a delay or setback. But I would definitely say dive in, you know, get your name started, get your website up, get your business cards. But you're going to learn from a lot of amazing people uh, what kind of pitfalls that they have, the challenges, but what really made them successful, what made them keep going. Grind set. And so I I really think it's just it goes back to the networking and making sure that you have your group of, of trusted people around you and and you're you're trying to make sure that everybody understands you know what's going on with them. Grind set on the Kazuki Network. Welcome back to another episode of Grind Set. I'm your host Cynthia Daniels, Chief Event Strategist of Cynthia Daniels and Company. And I'm your co-host Williams Brack, asset-based lender at First Tennessee Bank. And today we have Kelly Dobbins, president of Mid-South Drug Testing Incorporated. Uh, It's a very unique uh, business that she has. So we're really excited to find out, you know, with more than 25 years of experience, what has made her successful in her company and how has she adjusted to some of the changes in the the industry? Now, I met Kelly at a networking event um, at the Memphis Chamber. Okay. Um, And. Doing my research for this show, I found out that she was a Memphis Business Journal Superwoman in Business. That's impressive. A finalist (laughs) for Executive of the Year twice. Okay. And a Memphis Women Magazine, 50 Women Who Make a Difference. And so I'm really looking forward to interviewing Kelly today because these are high standards to live up to. Oh, we're in for a treat. So we are really excited. You're listening to Grind Set, powered by the Kazookian Network, and we will be right back with Kelly Dobbins, president of Mid South Drug Testing. Grind Set on the Kazookian Network. Inside 901. Inside 901. I am your host, Lieutenant Anthony Buckner. Here on Inside 901, we will unpack the vision of Shelby County Sheriff Floyd Bonner and the various divisions of the Shelby County Sheriff's Office. We have a racial profiling policy at the Sheriff's Office. We are here to it. We expect our officers to adhere to it. Uniform patrol that provide police services to unincorporated Shelby County. Inside 901. Hola, me llamo Alexandra Matlock y soy la gerente general de Contigo Creative. Eh, ustedes están escuchando Grindset, que está presentado por Kutsuki Network. As promised, we have Kelly Dobbins in the studio with us today, president of Mid South Drug Testing Incorporated. Welcome. Hi, Kelly. Hey. How are you doing today? <laughs> good. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, we have a lot of ground to cover in a short amount of time, so we're just going to jump right to it, if that's okay with you. Yes. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your company. What exactly is Mid-South Drug Testing? I, I think it sounds pretty clear, but there may be some people that need a little insight to it. We offer drug testing 24-7. Um, our service niche is coming to your facility. We offer urine, saliva, hair. We offer DNA, steroid testing, nicotine testing, Anything that you can do in the matrices of urine, saliva, and hair. Okay. We're a customer service focus. That's where the 24-7 comes in. Come okay. into your facility. Makes sense. Everybody has a bathroom. Right. We don't need to have a mobile facility. Okay. Um, and my particular company handles all the drug testing for the whole state of Tennessee, North Mississippi, Northeast Arkansas, and the Boot Hill, Missouri. So we're actually in four states. Okay. okay. So we have about a 200-mile radius. How did you even get started in that type of business? It sounds like it's, it's you're in high demand, obviously, but uh, how did that come about? It's an interesting story. I, I have a background in criminal justice, so I ran a probation company for 11 years. And in criminal justice, we always did our own drug testing, okay. which means we would do instant drug testing on probationers. Okay. So we always did the urine test on the probationers. And for some reason, I I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but when you have a job, there's a job that's yours that you don't know why it's not part of your job description, (laughs) whether it's making coffee, (laughs) taking out trash. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mine, you know, being the COO, CFO of this company, mine was always drug testing. I don't know if it's because I liked the technical part of it or the scientific part of it. Sure. 
But every time a drug testing question came up, they were always like, oh, well, go ask Kelly. Or You're the expert Kelly, now. <laughs> Kelly should go to the training on this. And so mm-hmm. I was always the one trying to figure out how we could beta test the next new hmm. new drug test that came out. With probationers, they don't really have any rights. So you could say, oh, we're going to drug test everybody today, and this is a new product. Let's see if it works. Wow. So we had a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> Maybe they didn't. A lot of fun. I like that. <laughs> a lot of fun beta testing. To see if new products worked, which, of course, the manufacturers loved yeah. because they had an audience. It may have only been 300 people, but yeah. they had an audience that yeah. they could you know, use Very for cool. that type of thing. So somewhere around the 2000s when saliva testing came out and hair testing pricing came down really low, we started getting a lot of calls from people outside of the probation world that wanted drug testing for their company, Mercedes-Benz, Tennessee College of Applied Technology. A lot of people started calling the company I worked for and said, do you do drug testing? Well, Mm -hmm. we did. And I told my boss, okay, we can do this. And then Mm -hmm. he's like, criminals have rights. Right. I mean, criminals don't have rights. Employees have rights. Right. I know what you meant. (laughs) So I said, we really need to get involved in the industry and figure out if we can do this. We got involved in the Drug and Alcohol Testing Industry Association in about 2001 or two. Mm -hmm. It started in 1995. Okay. And we got certified to do drug testing, um, employee drug testing. And I talked to my boss for about a year, and I said, we really should break off part of the company into a drug testing company. Interesting. And he came back and said, I've always handled criminals. Yeah. Criminals don't have rights. Employees do, and I don't want to do this. (laughs) He knew what he knew, and he yeah. wanted to stick to it. There you go. And I said, well, with all due respect, I want to leave. Wow. And he was not happy. Wow. I'd been there 11 years. Yeah. I helped grow his company to four times the size it was. That's incredible. And so it was kind of like a divorce, mm-hmm. you know, with mm-hmm. the boss. Yeah. And then he said, well, you know, what would really be cool is why don't you let me be your investor and I'll let you own 51% and I'll own 49%. And I said, with all due respect, wow. we already have that relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I do all fact. the work and fact. you do, you get all the money. There so you go. <laughs> no, I'll be going out on my own. Yeah. I hope our listeners heard that. <laughs> You're listening to Grind Set, powered by the Kazuki and Network. And here we're, we're here with Kelly Dobbins of Mid-South Drug Testing. And we're kind of hearing the, the origin story. And so you declined your boss's offer. And then you used your savings, um, your 401k, and stock from your mother as seed money for the business. What was your pitch to your mother to, for her to invest into your, your dream of have, starting a drug testing business? I'm interested in that. Well, um, my grandfather used to always tell this great story about how he invested in PepsiCo stock in the 1940s. Okay. So, <laughs> believe it or not, that was it split so many times. There was so much stock. Mother probably was a millionaire and didn't know it. I mean, wow. we never Kidding. knew it. Until he died, she didn't have any of the stock. Wow. When she got the stock, she said, I have all this stock. And I'm like, oh, my God, we need to diversify it. You can't just have it. <laughs> you know, what if PepsiCo goes under? You know, you got to move it somewhere. Yeah. So, my brother and I, well, actually, mm. I went to a financial firm and they said you know you need to put it in different places right and so I asked her I said what would you think about investing a hundred thousand in the company and just off the top of my head gave her some ridiculous percentage you know <laughs> to pay her back <laughs> so just shot yeah. well a rich actually over about a 10-year period she probably made about fifty thousand off of me just because it there was no it was me and her, and it was putting money back right. so that, you know, I could pay it off a different way than I would have a bank. Right. Mm-hmm. And so mom was like, yeah, why not? Yeah. I mean, I because when she first got all this stock, she's like, I got the stock. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, she she was good with it. And she got paid every month. And it was really helpful for her because in retirement, mm-hmm. she didn't have a steady paycheck. Okay. So I was able to give her 1000 or 1500 a month, whatever our payment arrangements were. Yeah. Okay. And that was what she needed to live on. Nice. So as long as I was paying her, she could pay her bills. And if I got behind, she's like, um, I got to pay the bills this month. So there was accountability. Yeah. Right. And she was making money on it. And so eventually, you know, everybody was happy because there was money going back into the coffers. So was the business instantly profitable? <laughs> 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 well, that leads us into the first year. What was that first year like for you, well, Kelly? Let me let me ask. Can I ask that oh. question a different way? Yes, you can. So, when you left, you had a business plan. How did your business plan differ from the first two years in business? 
I left with eight drug testing companies. My okay. boss was very gracious. They didn't do any probation work. They were private companies that dealt with employees. They didn't have people on probation. It didn't make any sense to do that. So he allowed me to leave with them. And then from then, from there, um, part of our agreement was for me to receive a salary for six months or eight months. Okay. So I was still able to help fund it that way. So the oh, wow. first year was kind of taken care of. Yeah. After that, um, I ran, I started meeting a lot of women business owners. Mm-hmm. Um, Susan Miller, Tammy Large, a lot of people that had their own businesses. And they said, oh, you need to get involved in the Apartment Association. Or you need to get involved in the Small Business Chamber. Or, oh, you need to get involved in this association. And so I joined as many associations as I could. Most of them will let you go to free luncheons for three times. Yes. And so you go network with everybody to see if you could figure out how to get into business. And what I found out in Memphis was it's all about your face, who you know, and being in front of people. Yep. Eventually people go, (laughs) oh, you're the drug testing lady. (laughs) So for me, that was very, very important that second year to make sure that I did that. So third year, then I was chasing all the leads. There you go. Yeah. I was still relatively broke, but... But the leads were coming in. I was still getting a little business here and a little business here and a little business here. It was enough to pay the bills. And I was able to just go out and sell and sell and sell and sell. And that's pretty much where I was the first probably five or six years. Got it. You're listening to Grind Set on the Kazookian Network. We're here at Kelly Dobbins of Mid-South Drug Testing. And we're still in kind of the origin story of the phase. But after the break, we're going to talk about growing the business that you actually started. The Chairman's Perspective. Hi, this is Lee Eric Smith. Let's take a look inside Shelby County government as we unleash some of the views of our very own Chairman of the Shelby County Commission, Van Turner. The Chairman's Perspective on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Kazookian.com, or your favorite podcast provider. The Chairman's Perspective on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! This is Kelly Dobbins, President of Mid-South Drug Testing, and I invite you to check out Grindset on the Kazookian app or your favorite podcast provider. Welcome back to Grind Set. We're here with Kelly Dobbins, the president of Mid-South Drug Testing. And when we finished the last segment, you talked about selling and selling and selling, networking and more selling, right? And typically what that means is growth. And people love growth until you have to manage cash flow. How were you as an entrepreneur able to manage your ca- cash flow during this growth phase? It was difficult. Um, first thing we tried was factoring, which was great because we had some big invoices yep. that might not get paid for 90 days. 90? Some were 60, some were 90. Wow. The state tried to pay us within um, 14 to 30 days, which was great. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know this, but at one point Memphis had boxing. And we actually really? had a contract <laughs> with the state of Tennessee, yeah. and we drug tested all the boxers. It was a very cool gig at the <laughs> FedEx Forum. Yeah. And they're the only ones that really paid us on time. Wow. Oh, wow. It wasn't a lot of money, but they paid us on time. Yeah. yeah. But the larger contracts, I was able to go through a company out of Nashville, and they factored, and I think they kept 90% of it until it got paid back. And there was well, they, a lot they of paid math you 90% involved. 90% of it until? Until the invoice came in, and somehow or another... It wasn't that bad of a deal. Yeah. You know, we did that for a long... We probably did that for about three years. Okay. We had a good okay. relationship until we could get on top of it. Um, we did some non-traditional loans. Most everything that I looked at, though, once I did it, the interest was too high to be able to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Eventually, we got into some of the merchant um, loans where they took whatever your credit card sales were... And they multiplied at times, I don't know, a thousand or something crazy, and then they just debited your account every day. And that was something that we could not we could not do. Wow, that mm-hmm. sounds brutal. Yeah. And so at what point did you enter into a banking relationship after using all these different alternative forms of financing your business? I've had a banking relationship the entire time I've been in business. I came oh, from great. a banking background. Okay. So. okay. A lending relationship a with lending a bank right. instead of just a deposit, right? <laughs> just a deposit. I started banking with Independent Bank um, probably around 2007, and it took a while, but eventually they lended me a line of credit. Actually, First Tennessee did, too. There was a lady at First Tennessee that loved my story. Shout mm-hmm. out to First Tennessee. And she uh, <laughs> she gave me a line of credit 
and she said, I know you don't have an account with us, but you were an employee for nine years. So wow. I just love your story. And yeah. she gave me a $50,000 line of credit signature only paid it back. Actually, I still have a line of credit with First Tennessee. Oh, yeah. Just because it just never, never went know. away. Yeah. Or know? just because it's a great bank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I may be biased. Same with plug. <laughs> but yeah, Independent eventually gave me a, a line of credit. And, mm-hmm. and more than anything, um, I think for small businesses and entrepreneurs, it's hard because you hawk your house, you hawk your car. Right. And there gets to be a point where you're like, when do I get a credit card in Mid-South Drug Testing's name? Yeah. <laughs> oh, all the credit cards in Mid-South Drug Testing's <laughs> name, they just are associated with my income. Mm. Exactly. They need to be associated with the company income because the company may have a million in revenues. Mm-hmm. Kelly Dobbins doesn't. Right. Right. That's a, That's a huge yeah. problem. That's a major key alert. <laughs> <laughs> get the credit card in the business name. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So you're listening to Grind Fed, powered by the Kazookian Network. Uh, Kelly, what I'm really interested in hearing is, was there resistance to uh, you being a woman kind of entering this field? What was that like for you? Well, I'd already entered into criminal justice, which is a man's world. Okay. So, so you were used to it. Well, and before that, my first major in college was commercial music. And that was in the 80s. Oh, wow. And that was a man's world. Okay. So I was kind of already used to it. Mm-hmm. I think the difference was I came into drug testing from the back as instant urine, saliva, and hair. Okay. And everybody else in the industry that I met was doing lab-based urine for federal companies. Okay. They weren't doing individuals and small companies and giving people a choice. They were like, we're just doing the mandated testing. And I'm like, but everybody wants to test. Right. (laughs) So you have a choice. So you can test however you want to test. Yeah. So I, I think... I was kind of that breath of fresh air into the industry in that regard, because now Mm -hmm. there's a whole lot more companies out there that give people choices. Obviously, if you're mandated, you don't have a choice. Right. But that doesn't have to be the only drug testing you do. You can do all kinds of different drug testing. Okay. Okay. And then just for our listeners out there, um, it sounds again like you were a pro kind of being in a man's world. But if there's a woman listening that's interested in starting a business that's not traditional as a woman leading that company, what advice would you give her? Uh Oh, you got to see her laying her back. She's she's getting ready to lay one on us. (laughs) First of all, I think we go back to networking is key. Okay. Um, The other thing is, is you really have to have a strong personality to be an entrepreneur anyway. Very true. But as a woman, you need to speak your truth and speak it loudly and talk to everyone you know. There have been just as many men that were fascinated with me and interested in what I did as women. Mm -hmm. And I think the difference is not that we can do anything better, but I think that you show them that you have a different way of doing it. Right. I think that women have a different take on business Mm -hmm. than men do, even if it's the same business. True. Very true. And so I think that you just have your own way of saying, well, you know, when I do it, I do it this way. And they're like, well, I do it this way. And we're like, well, they're both good ways, but there's a reason I do it this way. (laughs) Right. And so I I really think it's just, it goes back to the networking and making sure that you have your group of, of trusted people around you and, and you're, you're trying to make sure that everybody understands you know, what's going on with it. Now, you talked about the importance of networking to grow your business, but speak to the 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 impact of networking on accountability and making sure you achieve your goals. We um, had a great group of ladies back in about 2007. We called it the CATS group. C-A-T-Z, because we were like herding cats, because we're all so busy, we don't have time for each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we decided on a breakfast meeting, lunch meeting, drinks meeting, we didn't care, but we were going to commit one hour a month to each other. That's not a huge commitment. Well, it's hard when you're, when you have young children, which most of us had young children, you know, and or you know, middle school, which is even worse. Um, and we were trying to juggle a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was a single mom and had a business and had two children and, um, most of my friends were in the same boat. But what we did is we used a lot of different business resources, business books. We used a wonderful book called five. We used a lot of different different tools and we we had goals we had personal goals we had work goals we had different things that we would try to achieve and so our our goal every month was to get together 
and to look at what we said that we wanted to achieve on a monthly, yearly, every five year basis. Yep. Okay. And we would always rewrite them. Okay. You know, every and we had deadlines. Mm-hmm. Now, if we had a bad month, we could scoot them back a month. <laughs> but you still had the accountability because you never ever missed a meeting. If you ever missed a meeting, it was like just the worst thing ever. Even if you didn't do any of the work, yeah. you had to show up. And the group went on for probably four or five years. It was a great group. And it eventually went from five people to three people. It was still great. All of us were in different professions. Mm-hmm. We had um, originally one lady owned a, um answering advantage company. She um, owned a telephone company that did answering service. We had one lady that um, originally did corporate housing, and okay. she became a real estate agent. Had another lady that was part of a, a team that was a professional organizer, and then there was me. Um, the group stayed together for a while, and eventually when it broke up, it was probably one of the things that I've missed the most. Recently, it's been brought back to my attention that there's some accountability groups between my friends. They call it the the board of directors, and they get together, <laughs> and it's the same concept. They've been getting together for about six years. It's not my same group of friends. It's a different group of friends, but... I was telling, you know, Williams earlier that I really think that that's something that's missing from my life. Mm-hmm. I think that with the networking and everything that's going on, you really need a group that you get together. As a small business owner, you are the board. You're the everything. Yeah. Right, right. And so, yeah, you you talk to your friends and you talk to your kids and you talk to your boss and, I mean, you talk to your husband, but you don't really have that accountability yeah. group. And I think that's one of the things that's missing. I think that's a great segue into the final segment to talk about what the business is today, um, where you want to take it. But I also kind of want to touch on some of the comedic things of drug testing when we get back. You're listening to Grind Set, and we'll be right back after the break. My name is Richard Douglas Jones. I am one of the hosts for Black Nerd Power. Uh, who am I? I'm a uh, stand-up comic. You may have seen me on Comedy Central on the LOL Network. Black Nerd Power. I've been living this nerd life for a long time, like comic books and movies and all that other stuff. That's who we are. Just come hang out with us, man. Just geek out a little bit. It's okay. We won't tell. Black Nerd Power. And if you're a black nerd, you've had to hide that for most of your life. Black Nerd Power on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian. Grind set. On the Kazuki Network. We're back with Kelly Dobbins, and this has definitely been a very informative and entertaining uh, episode. And I have to say, because I actually have a background in HR, I can relate to some things that you're saying. So definitely later on in this segment, we have to talk about some of the some of the funny, crazy things that we've seen with drug testing. I love to do that. Oh yeah. <laughs> but before we do that, we have a lot of listeners that are current business owners and they're doing everything themselves and you've mentioned a few times that you have obviously a staff of employees that help you how did you know it was time for you to actually hire your first person Um, tell us a little bit about that having a background in operations and finance not realizing in the beginning that sales would be my job as I worked through I had three employees to start with and as I worked through kind of what our roles were I figured out very quickly that we all had to drug test. That was obvious. (laughs) Right. Okay, but then I also realized I'm very good at operations and I'm very good at finance, but somebody has to sell. Right. So I figured out that must be me. I'm going to be the face of the organization. So the first two positions I hired were finance and operations, someone that could handle the bookkeeping, that could make the deposits, that could do the payroll. Okay. You find an accountant, a good one. And you find a lawyer who can write up information and you can call when you have an employee problem. The dream team, huh? The yeah. dream team. Yeah. Everybody drug test. Everybody worked the front desk. Everybody did everything else. So in the beginning, there were three of us. Eventually, there were four of us. Eventually, there were five of us. Okay. Um, but it started out very small and it stayed that way for a long time. As long as everybody could do everything, we right. didn't really need a whole lot of other people. Okay. And in addition to being responsible for yourself and your family... You had to be responsible for other families. And then trying to run a business as a sole salesperson, you had some family events that kind of affected it a bit. You mind sharing a little bit about that and how you've kind of come through it? Sure. Well, in 2008, when the economy tanked, that's when our business really became 24-7. There were people, especially the city of Memphis, that was asking me to have a 
24-7 location. And I said, I don't even want to be in a gas station in Germantown <laughs> at midnight, much less having an open location anywhere in Memphis. But you have fire stations and you have police stations and we can come to you. So the whole concept of 24-7 kind of became that. Mm. Later on, around 2011, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And 2011 to 2013... I took her to chemo three to four times a week, and I was not in the business as much as I would have liked to have been. Mm -hmm. And she passed away in 13, and I came back and kind of had this resilience and was ready to work because I'd spent so much time with her, and I was so sad for her to be gone, but I was also happy that she wasn't in pain. Right. Had a lot of articles, had a lot of awards, had a lot of things that came Super back Superwoman in business. Super I'm telling you, it's a big deal. And then in 2015, Dad died. Mm-hmm. And about the same time, I moved from the house in Germantown. The children had graduated school. It was time to move back to Midtown, get my old roots back. <laughs> and the business was starting to tank a little bit at that point. The Tennessee Department of Correction contract was not doing well. Um, I had not bid it correctly, so I was in the process of rebidding it. We'd had it for five years. They were tacking on a year here and a year here. Mm -hmm. And it just miraculously, through all that change, it started getting better. And it it got better, and then all of a sudden, they rebid the contract and gave it to a company in California that charged double what I did. What? You're kidding. No. There ought to be some crime against the state of Tennessee giving contracts to anyone out of the state of Tennessee. I definitely prefer my tax dollars going to a local business like yours versus being shipped out to California. But now that the state of Tennessee contract has been lost, what's the plan going forward? How do you rebuild? I should have been rebuilding all along. The sales cycle is slow. And if you're building it, even when revenues are there, then you're never going to lose the momentum. What happened to me with spending so much time with family deaths and moving and the office moving and all these different things is I wasn't working the sales cycle. So now I'm pedaling twice as fast, trying to get out there to everything I know to do from organizations to speaking at Lunch and Learns to this wonderful podcast to (laughs) continuing legal education. I do anytime someone wants to hear about drug testing, I'm there. I want to talk about it. So the sales cycle... Right now, I'm still getting business coming in, but it was not at the momentum it should have been had I been working it two years ago. Well, the lesson here on Grind Set is always be selling, right? <laughs> always. <laughs> always. <laughs> always. And, and so we want to take that into talking about the lighter side of drug testing. Um, I, I read an article on the Internet and saw that an NBA player was uh, tested positive for being pregnant. <laughs> Needless to say, he got banned from professional basketball Do you have any funny stories like that or people trying to cheat drug tests? Well, actually, athletes do have to be tested for pregnancy, not usually men, but the women, (laughs) because if they're pregnant, they're going to lose their scholarship. However, in drug testing, we do not test for whether it's male or female. We do test for whether it's human. Because, wow, you know, human. your your dog can't bring, you know, you can't bring your dog's pee in. And I've never seen that one. Most of the dried urine that you can find on the Internet is deer urine because okay. people actually use that when they're deer hunting, which is huge down here. Okay, right. So they have to put urine around so the deer will come around so they can uh-huh. shoot it. So that, that's another fun thing. So they're actually using that with their drug testing. So hopefully, I've the deer doesn't smoke that. marijuana. <laughs> well, you have, <laughs> yeah, crazy. exactly. Well, you have to keep the urine warm. Right. So even the hunters, what? they know about the warming gloves, so they yeah. they keep it warm that way, yeah. and they keep it warm a lot of ways. <laughs> well, I definitely can say in my lifetime and working in HR, I mean, the temperatures were dead giveaways. You know, if it's too high, too low, we're like, okay, are you dead right now? Because <laughs> you shouldn't be walking and talking in front of me. So it's amazing to know. People keep urine on stash just in case. I mean, just cut out the drugs and you'll be fine. <laughs> That's what they say. They used to call and say, how do I pass a drug test? And I'd say, don't use drugs. Don't use drugs. <laughs> After that, how do you pass a drug test? <laughs> Is well, there alternative? <laughs> I, have had, I have had people come in and say, I need you to write a letter saying that this, this substance that I use didn't work. 
in passing the drug test so I can get my money back from the internet. <laughs> oh my God. Now that I've never heard. Said, no, I'm not giving you a letter saying what you <laughs> used didn't work. You right. just tell them you failed the test. Well, can I have a copy of the failed test? If they paid for it, they can get a copy. If yeah. they didn't. Oh my gosh. Well, I've heard there are all kind of teas and stuff people say work and again in my line i've definitely had to terminate tons of people because whatever product you thought you bought off the internet it's not working sorry just don't do drugs don't do drugs <laughs> i think i think that, i think that's a good ending to the, <laughs> the show like don't I mean, do drugs it's, it's, don't do drugs yeah. but kelly where can we find out more information about you and mid-south drug testing in case some of our listeners want to use your services www.midsouthdrugtesting.com. You can also find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. My phone number is 901-320-9295. Can you repeat that number? 901-320-9295. We might make a jingle out of it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on Grind Set and, uh, and sharing your amazing story with us. Yeah, this was just an incredible conversation to have. You gave me some flashbacks of the good old <laughs> days, but I think just women that are listening to this episode are really going to be empowered by the words of advice you gave. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Grind Set, powered by the Kazookian Network, and we'll be right back with the major keys and the woman power moment after the break. The Chairman's Perspective. Hi, this is Lee Eric Smith. Let's take a look inside Shelby County government as we unleash some of the views of our very own Chairman of the Shelby County Commission, Van Turner. The Chairman's Perspective on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Kazookian.com, or your favorite podcast provider. The Chairman's Perspective on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! Welcome back to Grind Set. You know, I hope you enjoyed Kelly's story as much as we did. And what I want to do is make sure I, I share the major keys that I pulled from the interview, even though I didn't yell it every time through the interview. Um, the first one is in Memphis, it's about who you know and being in front of people. They do business when they know you're in business. Um, the other is transition the credit from the startup phase from credit cards in your name to credit cards in the business name. Um, other, the other one is networking is key. You have to be around whether that looks like serving on the board or your industry, going to networking events locally, serving on nonprofit boards, etc. Speak your truth and speak it loudly as a woman business owner. Don't be ashamed. Speak up for yourself. Go out and get that business. And you know, your way is worthy. Next is Network for friends, but also network for accountability and people who will hold you to your goals. And the last one is a, a financial major key. Learn how to manage your cash flow. Your employees want to get paid every two weeks. And sometimes your business only gets paid every 30, 60, 90 days. And Kelly was able to offer some great options for not only growing business owners, but new business owners as well. Uh, definitely. And for me, my woman power quote, uh, it says women are like tea bags. We don't know our true strength until we are in hot water. And that was by Eleanor Roosevelt. I think with Kelly's journey, she's definitely shared some ups and downs of her business, but she stayed resilient uh, and like a tea bag. She was able to stay true and, and strong in the hot water. She's definitely strong. and she, She's an awesome individual with a great business. And it was definitely a pleasure having Kelly here today. You've been listening to Grind Set, powered by the Kazuki and Network, and we'll see you next episode. Grind Set, executive producer, epicenter. Grind Set is directed, produced, and distributed by Kazuki and Network.